I've been looking for a giant fathom for well over a year after featuring it in a list video way back in 2020. These bikes are very popular and also very hard to find. So imagine my shock when I walked into Mojo Cycling and they just had this sitting there on the showroom floor. So I impulsively bought this bike on the spot and today we're gonna go over all the bike details and I'll offer some first ride impressions after two rides on this bike, both of which I've crashed on. So far, this bike has been a giant pain. <laughs> Seriously, who writes this shit? You did. Get out. I hate you, get Fine. out. I hate you too. Starting off, this is a 2021 model, even though there is a 2022 model. The two bikes are nearly identical, and I do have to applaud Giant for not increasing the price year over year. For 2021 and 2022, this bike retails for $1,500 at time of filming. That is pretty rare these days as a lot of bikes went up in price, but nothing changed on them. The differences between the two model years are the color options, and this 2021 model comes with a 12-speed Shimano Dior drivetrain, while the 2022 comes with a 10-speed Dior drivetrain. That's probably how they kept the price the same year over year, and I think it's pretty reasonable. The frame, geometry, and all the other specs are the same between the two model years. You can get the Fathom in either 27.5 inch wheels or 29 inch wheels like this bike here, and they also offer a higher spec build for $1,850 called the Giant Fathom 1. In my humble opinion, I think this model is the better value of the two. Up front, this bike has 130 millimeters of travel from Giant's own Crest 34 RCL. In my list video, I expressed my excitement for this fork to help reduce the price of these bikes, which I think they've succeeded in. But since that time, I've seen way too many negative reviews about this fork from customers. If you look at the comments section on Giant's video about this fork, you're gonna see a lot of people saying that it developed a clicking noise uh, within two to three rides. So unfortunately, that's not a good look for this fork. Hopefully they're getting that worked out on newer models, but that is something worth addressing here. I was fully aware of this issue before even buying this bike. I wanted to find out for myself and put my money where my mouth is, and we'll see if I have the same issues. Or I really hope not, but I'm gonna find out so you don't have to. You're welcome. I will of course report back if I do have this issue and what steps I take to uh, get it fixed. Another red flag on this fork is one of those warning stickers that advises you not to use this bike for downhill, free ride, or extreme sports. Which is rather odd because I feel like mountain biking falls into the extreme sports category. A word of advice if you're interested in doing some aggressive riding, learning to jump, hitting big drops, and a bike you're looking at has a warning sticker like that on the fork, I would avoid it and save up a little more money and buy something with a nicer fork from the get-go. If your intent is just to pedal around the woods, you don't care about learning big features or hitting massive jumps, anything like that, these types of forks are probably fine. What's even more confusing is on the handlebars, there is another sticker that says, this bicycle is specifically designed for off-road use and competition. What? Talk about mixed signals. It's specifically designed for off-road use and competition, but not any downhill free ride or extreme sports competition. You know, that type of competition where you go slow and ride on fast, smooth pavement? If the sticker said this handlebar is designed specifically for that, I'm like, okay, I get it. But it says this bicycle. I don't get it. The cockpit is all giant branded, the stem and handlebars and the grips that came on it were also giant branded. Um, I took those off and replaced with some Deity Super Cush grips because they're very cushy. Super cushy, you could say. I like these grips, they're very comfortable. The brakes are Tektro two-piston hydraulic brakes with 180 millimeter rotors front and rear. These brakes come on a lot of entry-level bikes and in my experience, they've been pretty decent. Not great, not terrible, so that's nice. And of course the rotors are resin pad only, which is my biggest pet peeve and a hill I'm willing to die on complaining about. A 12-speed Dior drivetrain is nice to see, but there is another common issue and that comes from the Praxis crank set. Well, not the crank set itself, but the chain ring. They spec it with a zero millimeter offset chain ring when it should be a three millimeter offset. Well, what problem does that create? You may be asking yourself. 
The chain slips off the front chain ring when you're in the climbing gear because the, the chain line is just way too crooked. And unfortunately, it happened to me yesterday while riding. I wasn't filming. I did email Praxis this morning. Uh, it is a Saturday, so I probably won't get a response until early next week. Just saying like, hey, this is a common issue. I've experienced it as well. Is there any possibility you can send me the correct chain ring? So I will uh, update you if that happens. Otherwise, the Dior is a solid drivetrain. The dropper post is also giant branded with 150 millimeters of drop on this size large. It functions well, the lever feel is actually pretty good, and there's a satisfying thud to let you know you're at max extension. Pretty interesting to see a quick release seat post clamp on a bike with a dropper post. Seems unnecessary, but here we are. Wheels are also giant branded with Shimano hubs, and they have a 30 millimeter internal width paired to a Maxxis Minion DHF up front and a Maxxis Aggressor out back. Both of those are at 2.5 inch width. Really impressive tire spec, and what's even cooler is this bike was shipped already tubeless. It had sealant in it, the shop told me that, they didn't do it. So that's a really nice bonus, especially if you're a newer rider and you've never converted a bike to tubeless. This frame has five water bottle bosses on the down tube, three on the top of it, two underneath, and it also has two water bottle bosses here on the seat tube. Plenty of mounting options, that's nice. No down tube protection on this bike, but that just gives me the opportunity to mastic tape it up. No chainstay protector other than a clear sticker, but I did a damn impressive job with mastic tape here. I don't normally like to toot my own horn, but honk honk, uh, this thing looks factory as f One final gripe, this bike does use a press fit bottom bracket. Not the end of the world, but I'd prefer to see a threaded bottom bracket on these bikes. Out of the box with these pink issy pedals that I put on all my bikes and this bottle cage that I have on there while I wait it, uh, it weighs 31.16 pounds. All in all, it's a pretty decent build for $1,500. Believe me, I think it's a hard pill to swallow calling $1,500 entry level or, or budget. That is a lot of money. But in the world of mountain biking, $1,500 isn't going to get you a, a trail weapon that's ready for anything. Um, all of these bikes in this price range are gonna come with some compromises. When I wasn't busy crashing on this bike, I found myself having a great time. The geometry on this size large Giant is very similar to my extra large Polygon Extrada, so it felt very familiar. The Giant's head tube angle is one degree slacker than the Polygon at 66 degrees, and it has a 75 degree seat tube angle. Numbers that I find to be pretty excellent on most trails. In my first couple rides, I actually liked the way this fork performed. I think it felt better than a lot of low-end Sun Tour forks, like the one that came on the Extrada, for example. It has usable small bump compliance, and the rebound adjuster actually makes a difference when you turn it, which can't be said for all budget forks. As with other budget forks, it does make that entry-level sound from the damper. That sound. Rather annoying. Would you like to hear it some more? There you go. I do hope I'm in that category of people that haven't had issues with this fork, but time will tell. I typically run less aggressive tires on my bikes because I'm a weight weenie, I guess, uh, but I found this tire combination offered excellent traction and I actually found myself getting up some technical climbs with ease. All right, here's the final boss. It's just very tricky. Oh, not a problem. All right, Giant, good job. That actually was easier on this than the Extrada. It's what inspired me to go try Depending Apple there. Turnover. Uh, that was last week's video. If you want to see me crash, be sure to check that out. All right, well, we did it. These tires are a bit more sluggish than I'm used to when just grinding up a fire road, but I do think that this bike climbs really well. I really like my Polygon Extrada, and this bike just feels like a slightly more capable version of it. The chainstay length and reach figures are identical on both bikes, but with that extra degree of slackness and a slightly longer wheelbase, this bike feels a little bit better going downhill. What's a unique phrase that no one uses to, to, to explain that? Confidence inspiring? It's still a hardtail, so I'm not setting any speed records on my normal downhill runs, but I don't care. I am having a really good time riding this bike. To sum it up, I'm grabbing the Polygon to do some more 
pedally XC rides. And then I'm grabbing the Fathom if I wanna do some more difficult terrain. As I ride this bike more, I'll have more thoughts to give to you later on in the future. And there you have it. That is my new Giant Fathom 29.2. I'm excited to have a Giant bike. I've never ridden one before, I don't believe, so excited to be trying a different brand. I hope this video was useful and helps you decide whether this bike is for you or not. I am pretty impressed with the value of this bike, especially now in 2022. Uh, my fear is that the fork is gonna have some issues and it's just gonna be a bigger hassle than it's worth. I hope that's not the case, but I'll find out for you. Realistically though, any mountain bike for $1,500 or less isn't going to come with a top performing fork. That's, that's just the reality of mountain biking. And I know I discussed a lot of negative points about this bike or potential points, and I don't do that to be mean or bash giant. This is just for people, if they're interested in buying this bike, I wanna be honest, and these are things you should probably know about if you're going to buy this bike. It's still a really good bike. If you have your heart set on it, I say go for it, but um, I would set aside some extra money if you decide you do need to replace that fork or you just want an upgrade. If you've only got 1500 bucks to spend now, that's fine, but you're probably gonna have to upgrade some things in the future. Or if you wanna wait a little bit longer, save up 2000 to $2,500, you're gonna get a pretty solid hardtail for that price. This sport has grown so much in the last couple of years and unfortunately prices have come up because of that and also supply chain issues and all that. You already know about all that. All right, I've run out of things to say and if you've made it this far, I appreciate your time and until the next one, stay rowdy within reason.